Hello and welcome to this online broadcast from White Temple Gallery. My name is Jane Scarth and I'm the Curator of Public Programmes at the Gallery. Tonight marks the launch of our latest book in our Documents of Contemporary Art series, co-published with Whitechapel Gallery and MIT Press, called Health. I'm delighted that we're joined today by the book's editor, Barbara Rodriguez Munoz, who will be hosting the event and features, um, today we're featuring a live conversation between Barbara, an artist and poet, Karani Barocca, alongside poetry readings from Pedro Neves Marquez, and specially commissioned guided meditation by Patricia Dominguez. The book and the event tonight considers how artists are increasingly confronting and reshaping ideologies of health, critically tackling illness and impairment in their practice, while, cha while challenging institutional failures to support multiple abilities. Through the presentations and conversation, we hope to make space for contributions to our thinking about how health intersects with sexuality, ethnicity, gender, class, and co coloniality. The book is available from the Whitechapel Gallery eShop. However, due to the impacts of new restrictions on our operation due to COVID-19, orders placed after Tuesday, the 3rd of November will be dispatched or made available for collection once the gallery reopens. And so if you'd like to get hold of the book sooner, the full range is available from most other online retailers and bookshops with a mail order service. And we'd actually recommend using uk.bookshop.org where you can buy directly from independent booksellers as an alternative to Amazon um, who have had to close their physical shop during this time. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight two resources available for this event. The first is closed captions, which can be activated by clicking the CC button in the bottom right side of the YouTube player. Um, thank you to Joanne, who is our captioner this evening. You can also follow these full screen um, by clicking a link in the chat, which I'll post just after I finish the introduction. The second is to highlight the easy read guide, which has been prepared and available on the event page. And that's something you can click through from the chat uh, on YouTube now. So I'm delighted to introduce Barbara Rodriguez Munoz, the book's editor. She is a writer and curator of temporary exhibitions at Welcome Collection. Her exhibitions include This Is a Voice uh, in 2016, Bedlam, which was co-curated with Mike Jay in 2017, and Joe Spence and Orit Ashery, Misbehaving Bodies, co-curated with George Vasey in 2019. Uh, she has also written for After All, Concreta, Marg, and Moose Publishing, amongst other publications. So thank you to Barbara for accepting the invitation to create this event uh, and everything you've done to develop it with us. And thank you also to the Welcome Collection, who've been an associate partner for this. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to all the artists for accepting our invitations and for their wonderful contributions to this evening. So I'll now hand over to you, Barbara. Thanks. Hi, um, thanks Jane. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with you shaping this event and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it unfolds this evening. Also thanks to the Whitechapel team and everyone that has joined us today from their homes in this second week of lockdown here in the UK and I guess very similar situations all around the world. I hope that wherever you are, you are as safe as, and as calm as one can be during these months of um, uncertainty and upheaval. I'm going to start by talking about uh, how the book came together, which I see as an extension of my practice at Welcome Collection. So many of the contributors are artists, thinkers I've worked with in the past, I'm working with in the present, or I would love to work in, in the future. And then I will move on to talk about the book's content and our wonderful contributors for today. I have some slides that I'm gonna share. So if you can please bear with me. Um, okay, so I've got some slides which I'm gonna describe as I go along for wider access and those that can access the video. And this presentation will take uh, more or less 15 minutes. The first image we see on the slide is the book cover and it's a steal from Weed Killer uh, by Patrick Staff. The cover shows a thermal image of a face and the word health in blue. I find this thermal aesthetic very loaded. Thermal cameras are used in cancer imaging, but also for surveillance during pandemics. 
to filter out individuals in public spaces such as airports who are suspected of carrying the virus. Weed Killer is inspired by Catherine Lohr's memoir, which relates their experiences of breast cancer and chemotherapy and the resulting effects on her body and relationship. Patrick describes it as a reflection of what it means to survive on one's own terms. I saw this complex and beautiful work in 2017 at a time where I felt there was a search in the production, visibility and analysis of contemporary artistic but also literary practices that critically explore illness, impairment and care. So the inspiration for the book is really these artists and writers in the intro to the book, I talk about the turn to health in contemporary art. And this is something that I hope we can both unpack and problematize during this event. My main sources of research and talents and hopefully growth are often literary. So in respect to this book, authors like Dodi Bellamy and Maggie Nelson, Carmen Maria Machado, Audre Lorde, um, Catherine Lorde and, and many others. And as Patrick Film embodies, I believe that there is a very rich dialogue between literary and artistic practices around vulnerability, often using the first person, and challenging normative perceptions of minds and bodies. And I was very keen to give a space to some of these literary voices alongside the contemporary artists. Within the broad spectrum of artists exploring health, I'm especially drawn to works with a drive to move beyond the individual body towards the social body. Um, with this, I mean how health and care intersect with race, with gender, with coloniality, and with other species. The current pandemic and climate breakdown are brutally exposing these fragile entanglements. And I believe that the contributors in the book can help us reimagining the ecosystem that sustain our lives. With this in mind, there is a quote from Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, Professor of Feminist and Environmental Studies, which I found um, very productive. The current slide shows a pull quote from the book by Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, um, designed by Smith, and it says, interdependency is not a contract, not a moral idea, it is a condition. So this is a notion of care that expands beyond us, not seen as a burden, but it opens to human and non-human relationships. There are two projects I curated, co-curated at Welcome Collection in 2017 and 18 that further expanded uh, my approach to thinking about health as a theme, as an experience shaped by science, religion, the marketplace, culture, politics, but also as institutional responsibility to create safer, more inclusive, more accessible spaces where vulnerability can be shared, where what is considered to be private and often taboo and the public can meet and to think about how I can support artists and audiences in these encounters. The first one of these projects is the exhibition comprised from artworks from our collection Ayurvedic Man, which I co-curated with cultural sociologist Sita Reddy. I will describe the slide. Um, we see a gallery space uh, with three vertical panels that hold five paintings and drawings, providing a visual interpretation of the organs and vessels of the human body according to ancient Sanskrit, Persian, and Tibetan knowledge. Through a process of investigating into the provenance of these artworks, so their origins, how they arrived to our collection following colonial roots, and the diverse artistic traditions that they depict, we wanted to understand the cultural encounters that have shaped the medical knowledge that they embody and how they've been understood across history. Tracing these journeys reveals an ongoing class between what is called traditional and what is called modern medicine. And I, I want to say that I'm uncomfortable with both terms. I don't believe in such a dichotomy, but I'm using them here for, for simplicity. Um, the reality is that most healing medical systems have been politicized, but also pit against each other in the global market. The exhibition and the book are not anchored in a critique of modern medicine as such. I firmly believe that an equitable and accessible um, ethical application of scientific knowledge to our lives and ecosystems is vital. Is vital, sorry. But both the book and the exhibition strongly criticize the colonial, patriarchal, corporate power that have historically established a hierarchy of medicine's agendas and priorities that has divided the healthy from the sick and that has created a dualism between the mind and the body. And within this complex landscape that we're all trying to navigate, I feel that there is a growing desire 
to reconceptualize the individual as a physical but also metaphysical entity, to reimagine what collective healing looks like and to undergo a holistic process of re-enchantment with our bodies. And many of the contributors to this book reflect on these desires. The second exhibition that provided some context and I guess a sense of relevance to this book was Misbehaving Bodies, which I co-curated uh, with uh, my colleague, George Vassi. And it was conceived as a dialogue between the practices of Joe Spence and Odit Asseri, focusing on the representation of chronic illness and dying. I will describe the slide. We see a gallery space with a photograph of Joe Spence um, with a swimming costume floating on water and two tent-like um, cocoon spaces defined by pink tie-dye fabric, um, which accommodate monitors playing Audit Asteris films. There are also two giant teddy bears with very long arms, which double up as comfy seating and where we happily witness some members of our public um, having a nap during the exhibition. And I think they really reflect on the sense of joy, humor and warmth uh, that is characteristic of the works of both um, Asteris and, and Spence. The exhibition starting point was the acquisition by Welcome Collection of some of uh, the prints by Jo Spence. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with her work. She was a British photographer, a cultural worker, an artist um, who used her life experience of illness to challenge conventional representations of what are considered to be perfect normative lives. The prints we acquire document her breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, her feelings of being infantilized by the doctors, her refusal to become a victim. And this approach was heavily influenced by writer Susan Sontag, um, critique of the use of metaphoric language, so terms like invasion and battle um, uh, use in medical settings, again highlighting the ongoing dialogue between art and literature. Both Sontag's essay, Illness as a Metaphor, and Joe Spence's The Picture of Health text are included in the book. So the process of developing this exhibition, um, of trying to create, to create a safer space for our audiences and collaborator, helped me to think about uh, institutional responsibility when it comes to develop curatorial, but also educational practices tackling health marginalization and challenge or challenging structural ableism. Artist Caroline Leisart has claimed that the hospital must be brought to the museum to precisely emphasize these issues. And it is artists that are mainly doing the hard work that are taking the burden of educating and reshaping institutions and their programs. So now just back to the more specific content on the book, I wanted to acknowledge that these more recent and artistic practices that the book is surveying are not happening in a void or suddenly, but they are part of an intergenerational dialogue and informed by feminist thinking as well as continuing the legacy of other 70s, 80s, 90s counterculture movements, such as artistic responses to the AIDS, HIV crisis, critical psychiatry, creep theory, and the colonial practices. These historical references provide the structure for the chapters that I'm going to briefly describe now. But I also wanted to add that although historic and well-known figures are mentioned in the book, my aim was to open up to other geographies, counter narratives, and contexts that remain more obscure. The current slide shows a quote by artist Ruth Rodney that says, what can art do in an ongoing epidemic? Um, so the first section touches, uh, is titled viral and touches on initial artistic and activist responses that arose during the early days of the AIDS HIV crisis in the UK and US, but it very quickly opens up to other geographies periods and identities that have been overlooked. The contributors here are exposing the continuity in artistic practices that strive to make epidemics visible, so HIV, Zika, COVID-19, demand political responsibility and challenge the stigmatization and neglect of marginalized communities. So for example, in the book, there is a conversation between artists, writers, at, um, Ted Kerr and Alex Juhas, where they discuss the re-emerging of AIDS activism through new intergenerational collectives, such as What Would an HIV Do?, which is a community of people joining in response to the ongoing AIDS crisis who understand the figure of the doula as someone who holds a space during times of transition. So for example, between diagnosis and treatment. The current slide shows a quote from the book by artist Dora Garcia, which reads, Radical psychiatry, radical politics, radical art, rage against the institution. 
So the second chapter, the institution the nine, takes its title from Italian psychiatrist Franco Basalia, 1968 seminal book, exploring how radical practice within total institutions such as psychiatric hospitals could overturn power structures and expose society's contradictions. Artists, thinkers, and curators are increasingly imagining alternative spaces for care and conviviality. However, the book also questions their legacy and sustainability and the potential sort for of art practices to meaningfully reach diverse communities. Um, and in the essay, there is a text by um, Mary Walling Blackburn. And in this text, the author questions what is repressed and who is excluded from what she calls artist self-institutions. The slide shows a quote by writer Dodi Bellamy and says, when the sick rule the world, mortality will be sexy. Narrating illness explores how sickness and wellness are currently defined through diaristic and embodied uh, approaches. So what are called autopathographies or a description of one's own illness. And it weaves, we weaves a dialogue between artistic and literary voices. The authors here reclaim multiplicity in the representation of illness experiences, resisting heroic modes of narration. So again, the relation between Susan Sontag and Joe Spence or Catherine Locke and Patrick Staff that I mentioned earlier. Self-care, oh, the slide shows a well-known quote by writer Adre Lord, which says, caring for myself is not self-indulgent, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Self-caring looks at the term self-care and how it's become so ubiquitous in online cultures and how it's somehow being perverted. It is more and more divorced from Lord's statement in the slide, which asserts that in precarity and as a minority, individuals and communities need to promote their own survival and instead is disguised as an alternative to the medical industrial complex, but is still co-opted by the marketplace. So glossy magazines and alternative wellness brands. As part of this critique in the sick woman theory, a text I see as very much the core of this book, artist and writer Johanna Hevda talks about a radical kinship and inter an interdependent sociality, a politics of care. The slide shows a quote from artist Caroline Lazar, which says, disability is structurally reinforced by ableism. So this chapter on creeping interrogates the impact of creep theories in artistic production and exhibition making. And as I mentioned earlier, this chapter contextualizes current shifts in the institutional treatment of disability to one driven by disabled artists, academics, and activists who are changing the ethics of representation. So, for example, the, guide, the guidelines by Caroline Lazard, Accessibility in the Arts, A Promise and a Practice, which are included in the book, or here in the UK, Access for Artists by Leah Clemens, Alice Hattrick, and Lizzie Rose. Kairani Baroka has also written and spoken extensively on these issues, and we'll be covering some of those with her during our Q&A. And finally, and the slide shows a quote by Tavita Rosari that says, to invoke the colonial healing, to demand the colonial healing, to practice the colonial healing. So this chapter tackles critical responses to biopower and the consequent renew in shamanic, ritualistic, and transcendental experiences in contemporary art. The starting po point is philosopher Peter Palpelbart's approach to biopower, which he describes as a form of power that has penetrated all levels of existence. So from the genes, the body, affectivity, the psyche, to intelligence, imagination, creativity, reducing the body to its health or its aesthetics. As an antidote, this section takes the title from the last essay in the book by Tabitha Resaire, titled The Colonial Healing in Defense of Spiritual Technologies. Mixing critique and prayers, the artist's ambitious healing as a space for both aesthetic liberation and political action to exercise toxic internalized dynamics to overcome transgenerational trauma and to reconnect with the land and collective consciousness. This last slide shows a quote uh, by writer Anne Boyer, which reads, we can, sew masks, um, we can sew masks and make disinfection kits to give to those who will be caring for the sick at home. Since the last revisions to this book, in March 2022, museums are closing their doors, artists and curators and other cultural workers losing their livelihoods and considering what their practice means in isolation, as well as rethinking institutional structures and programming decisions to support anti-racist movements. 
So I feel this is a moment when many of us are reflecting on our practices, how they may evolve, how we may transform ourselves. And my hope for this expansive anthology in health is that it can be part of a longer and also slower conversation and collective work towards shifting normative representations, placing care at the center of institutional and artistic practice and fully embracing the interdependency of our existence. And even if we are not able to celebrate this uh, lunch physically together, I wanted to end with some brief and heartfelt thanks to the extraordinary people and friends that have been part of the ongoing conversation that have shaped this book. I won't read all the names here, but a special shout out to um, the contributors, all the contributors to Francesca Winter and Anthony Isles and the rest of the team at the Whitechapel Gallery uh, for this unique opportunity and for shaping the book with me. It's been a real, real pleasure. And to welcome Library and my colleagues in collections and research for taking care of and expanding such an important resource on, on health, where I found many of the texts and references for the book. So now we're going to move on to our contributors. So we start with um, Pedro Neves Marquez. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. So Pedro Neves Marquez is a visual artist, filmmaker, and writer born in Lisbon. Forthcoming solo shows include um, Centro dos de Mayo in Madrid and Caixa Forum in Barcelona, as well as the participation in the Liverpool and Guanju Biennales. Pedro has sent us a beautiful and very calming pre-recorded video in which they read a brief selection of poems from their recent poetry book titled Sex as Care and Other Viral Poems. It's published by the New Literary and Poetry Press together with artist Alice Dos Reyes um, so the publishing press is called Pantano Books. Other viral poems draws an, an analogy, uh, sorry, draws an analogy between the spread of the Zika epidemic in Brazil, the genetic modification of its carrier mosquito, and the rise of fascism to mount a critique of both gender bias in science and anti-queer populism. Sex as care takes on a more loose and diaristic tone, speaking in the first person to the landscapes, the friendships and the romantic love. The reading will take um, six minutes and, and you can play the film now, please, Chris. Hi, this is Pedro Nevermark. I'll be reading some poems from a new book of mine called Sex as Care and other viral poems, as well as some other poems um, that will hopefully go into a new collection. So the eyelid prickle. So the eyelid prickle into mania. I got two lazy eye globes. Now alone I persist in this world. Diana with her infection on the operation table. Then the waters broke. The blade of the aluminum cut ties between the left and right ventricle. 4 a.m. sweat and trenches made of sheets. We can go so soon. Smallest details. We'll call the acupuncturist tomorrow. Will explain the prickling and fathom removal to the naked eye. Spend a lifetime thinking your rising is Virgo, when all the while it was Aries. But how much can an hour and the planet change you? Diana and the lover, now she can have many in her twelfth floor apartment. A tea too many leads her to the bathroom. Too much teen in the blather. It takes years for consequences to settle. I stay and watch the charred and the London eye. The beast from the east. After a week, the snow has finally melted. Alien Abduction Alien abduction stories were pregnancy stories in the time of IVF. And assisted reproduction little green men at work inside women's bodies. 
Scully bled from her nose after she got abducted by aliens. I was terrified as a child. The blood dripping down her lips was her menstrual flow, an abortion. I had bad dreams. So early the definition of life. Differentiation in womb, the choice is made in advance. Gender is nothing but a lump in rubber gloves and ultrasound gel. It's a boy. The babies, the babies, the babies. The babies, the babies. The babies. Even in love, science. Is obsession is it? Either or, binary divisions. To bite or be bitten, top or bottom, alpha and omega female or masculine, woman or man. In the end, even in a dream of hard one expression, the categories. Immunology. He, it, goes out dressed up in a mosquito net, gloves with no fingers, manipulating machines of retrieval. Specimens he believes were once normal, believes it can make the world safe. Boots underneath the mesh, a military pattern, mimicking the nature it he is paranoid about. Love beyond binaries. Thinks it he will protect her. Head covered, barely breathes. Leaves a mosquito trap in the wild, then gas lights her for questioning it. The trap. The militarization of biology is a language of suppression. When the state begins to wane, the suppression of language is the biology of militarization. Bacteria in love. Her fingernail ready to fall from her annular finger. As it will not regrow, her flesh is for now vulnerable. Soon, though, it will thicken, brimming with memories of a bad year. Bacteria and love for oysters and summer showers. Bacteria in love. Memory. I connect every little detail to disease and then back to memory. Every day, like the days I recalled, a flood of feelings, feeling sickly, and the days before I felt sick, before I was an I becomes you and never lets go. Hello, um, I feel a bit like a TV presenter. <laughs> okay, so the next contributor is here with us. Um, hi, Karani Baroka. Hi, Oka. Hi, Barbara. Hi. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's very nice to share a screen. I was going to say stage, yeah. it's not a screen yeah. with you again. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Karani Baroka. She's a writer and artist from Jakarta whose work has been presented in 16 countries. She's currently researching residency at the research and research fellow at the University of the Arts London, the Colonizing Arts Institute, an associate artist at the Nasila Center for Writing. Baroka is currently working on a book uh, of memoir, cultural criticism on the COVID-19 pandemic. And she's also developing a related artwork for acquisition at Welcome Collection, reflecting on how the word hidden 
has manifested in the pandemic across different interlink biomes. So before our conversation today, Oka is going to read the, the two poems included in the book. Um, the first one is titled Medusuzoa, Neuropathic Pain, and the second one is titled um, Rest Stop. Um, yes. Over to you, Oka. Thank you. Medusazoa, neuropathic pain. In Kalimantan, a lake so inland in exile that jellyfish there have no sense of sting. Divers swim at ease, brushing legs against ghosts. Evolving out of our sense of poisoning tentacles is possibility. Breathe this. The world is dying, yet holds both my enduring corpus and animals whose limbs have wept away all hurt. This is blessed plurality of sense. This a many tentacled neuron diversity. This a synapse in colenterate could tell us not to kill us. A synapse in ourselves could try to fail to fall wet. Rest stop. Body reminds me to love thyself with a harpsichord of crowing nerves. And so the beats for rest. And so reminds alive, alive. And now with medicine, finally body, a kinder weather vein more often. Body is everything underneath and between the weather. The weather is what everything it withstands. And so not a droplet of hate for body since breaking began in it only when called for infernos of weather. Laughingly, I realized that this is what's meant by under the weather for me, by weathering, pain, imprint of and on unique body mine, crackles, stutters within, and so the beats for rest. And so, ma'am, what is productivity unit of self is not alive, alive, dear body, one body, slight body, ephemeral mass. I hum not to weather, to rush of lost seeking, to able the sumption spoon fed to the mob, time ticking markets of stock at the altar of rainforest used as ponds. This is not the song. To body goes humming, goes all the hum. Thank you. Thanks so much, Oka. Well, you know, I love these poems, but it's much more compelling when I hear you performing them. So thank you very much for this. Oh, thanks for including me in the book. So maybe we can start by talking about poetry. Um, sure. um, you know that I first came across your work in a performance you did at um, Raven Row in London, mm. which was titled, well, it was an event titled, I think, Sick Time, Sick time is Resist Time. Yeah. And it was part of the incredibly powerful exhibition um, titled Domestic, which was uh, curated by Naomi Hears, who is included in the book, mm -hmm. and Amy Butt. Um, and in this event, you perform your poem Sliding Scale, and you also perform Indigenous Species, which is a braille text poetry art book uh, addressing issues of pollution, consumerism, and habitat destruction. So I think we can start by discussing the role of poetry in your artistic practice and how it intersects with your performance and your academic work as well. I'm interested in those overlaps. Yeah, sure. I mean, the definition of what poetry is is so liminal, right? Um, and I think that I'm a practice-based researcher. I think things through by feeling them in the body and by articulating them in the body. And I don't often know what I'm doing until I look back on a performance or a piece of writing, um, which is performance in and of itself in a way, right? Um, and uh, for me, I think what's, what's really fascinating and, and why I, I stick to poetry a lot, uh, not only because I've been writing it throughout my life, um, but because poetry is, is the space where, despite the fact that um, there tends to be a, uh, an interpretation of work by racialized brown um, women or non-binary people as being automatically autobiographical, I think poetry lives in this beautiful space where it could be fiction, it could be nonfiction. And there are probably elements of, um, of both in one poem potentially, right? Uh, and I think that that lends itself very well to 
this very um, multimodal understanding of illness and narratives of illness, which is why um, I was telling you a little bit earlier, I really like being placed <laughs> in this book amongst uh, such a plurality of voices regarding illness, uh, because I think that when people hear poems about illness or chronic illness or pain or the body or disability, they automatically place it within their own preconceived, you know, usually tainted by lots of different kinds of ableisms, um, understandings of healing and cure and, and inspiration port and what we call it, right? Um, and even that poem Rest Stop, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but I added, you know, a body, a kinder weather vane more often because I think, I mean, even now I get people who work with me all the time who are like, oh my God, you're still sick, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who, who, because, you know, they think it needs to have an end, a neat story, right? Or that, you know, this is a, this is a, I, I've often been sort of portrayed as, um, you know, overcoming obstacles, quote unquote, right? And so, to mess with that a little, using fiction, as you know, in my work and nonfiction and elements of, um, I mean, in indigenous species, you know, my mother's face is in it, my face is in it, but the character is fictional, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just love um, sort of pushing it at people and getting them to interrogate their own understandings of the body. And this kind of linear journey of recovery, which what we is what we see usually in, in popular culture. Um, but I understand, yeah. and, and from working with you, I understand better how your work is informed by disability justice. And, and I wanted to talk a bit about access and, and how you understand access as generative, as integral mm -hmm. to, to the process of developing the work, but also the outcomes. Um, so yeah, of course, indigenous species is a braille text poetry book, but also perhaps it'll be, I thought we could talk about um, your performance slash installation at uh, SALT in Basel as an example mm -hmm. of this approach to generative access. Yeah, sure. So Indigenous Species, um, which came out in 2016 with Filtered Access Press, uh, is, a, is, a, is an artwork and a poem at the same time with many different lives, right? It began as a commissioned spoken word poetry piece for a festival in Melbourne in 2013. And then uh, because I was already thinking in terms of access as generative and disability justice, I always thought, you know what, I would really love for this to be accessible to people who are hard of hearing and or deaf. So um, I made it into an illustrated book with fake braille on every left-hand side of the page. And I asked that it be marketed as a cited version to show us, you know, even though I, I, I can't see very well at all without glasses or contacts, these access aids are not stigmatized, right? Mm -hmm. They're not stigmatized as much as when I use a cane or a wheelchair, right? Like it's it's so interesting how how um, uh, passing works when you're when you're disabled and use different kinds of access aids. Um, so then it became, you know, a tactile thing, a book, but I understand that, you know, we have two different um, accessible ebook versions of that book as well, which is great because then it lives on as another kind of voice for people who use screen readers. So to think of a poem as always being, uh, and an artwork as always being accessible in various kinds of ways, you know, I mean, in terms of self-description, I'm glad that you self-described that you, that you described the slides, you know, if you're describing, if I'm describing myself now, for instance, uh, I think an, an approach that a lot of museums and galleries might take is, you know, uh, a woman with glasses and red lipstick and a long dangly earring and a white and black pattern dress, you know, with long hair tied back is speaking in front of two paintings. But there are other ways to describe <laughs> objects and things. And you could say, for instance, um, you could tell different stories. You could uh, play with access and audio description as an artwork in and of itself, which is what a lot of um, disabled artists, including myself, are currently doing. So with the Salts Basel exhibition that you mentioned, um, that was a performance installation called Selected Anna's, part of my Anna Infinite series. And in it, on opening night, so I had these three large scale digital multimedia collage installations. Um, sorry. Uh, um, uh, yes, yes, prints, but then also there is also some, some other media going on attached to them. <laughs> and uh, instead of having, you know, the usual let's say, put on headphones and when you walk by them, it's described in a very sort of rote 
a positivist, rational, enlightenment way, you know, my performance in the on opening night, um, in which, by the way, I asked everybody to lie down on on carpets because, as you know, for all of my performances, I want people like myself to feel comfortable. So I always insist that there be bean bags or rugs or things where people can lie down. Um, so I performed. And in my performance, you know, I'm talking, I'm speaking as, I'm acting as various different Indonesian heritage characters who are femme throughout history. But then they're also describing these three works. And as soon as the um, performance ended, then the audio of my performance was looped around the gallery for the duration of the exhibition. So people walk into the gallery and they didn't necessarily know that they were experiencing audio description, but it was audio description. It was it was an, it was embedded in the artwork, and that's what I'm 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 interested in. Is sort of um, I think it's very strange how access seems to be like an add on for for a lot of institutions. And so when, highlighted, no? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, when when really you know that's a choice. That is an artistic choice <laughs> to do audio descriptions a certain way, to do self descriptions a certain way, to. Um, to capture in a certain way. But it's changing a lot. I remember having to have very hard conversations to persuade artists to subtitle their work for, for presentation in galleries. And now most artists will agree with that. So it's changing. I think it's changing quickly. I mean, yeah. I know we about something different, but it's changing quickly. No, I agree with you. Um, I remember when I first arrived in the UK 2015, um, the the series that would eventually become on an infinite, I described it to someone and they said, oh, but that's a fantasy mm. to have things be that accessible. This yeah. is like a yeah. fantasy. Yeah. And they changed their, their tune very quickly in those five years because I think of this momentum of, of disability justice activists and various kinds of, I'm also interested in decolonial healing, which you, you mentioned and yeah. it's also in the book and different kinds of disability justice that are rooted in biomes, that are rooted in localities and and, and how translation plays a part in that as well. Yeah, so this leads me to my next question, which I'm, let's see if this works. I'm also gonna use the opportunity to answer somebody from other from our audience today. So I'm gonna read the question on the chat and answer it and then answer you <laughs> and then ask you a, a related question. I definitely feel like a TV presenter now. Okay, so the question is, how much do you recognize the intersectional applications of health? Noting this as Audre Lorde primarily wrote her quote on self-care and so much more for black women, um, of course. Um, so yeah, I thought this is something that makes sense to discuss here with you. I mean, from my point of view and for the book, um, my approach is to give a space to a diverse range of artists that are looking at um, health in intersection um, with race, with coloniality, with the environment and with, um, um, yeah, and with so many other kind of uh, factors or identities. Um, so one very good example of this is, is your work, uh, Oka, um, and you talk about your approach to disability justice and how you center it as an anti-colonial practice. Um, so I wonder what was the starting point um, for you for this approach? And I'm especially curious to find out how you kind of manifest in your work you're doing at the University of the Arts in London. Mm -hmm. Sure, so it began to manifest when I first identified as disabled. I was horribly ableist <laughs> before I identified as disabled. You know, I was, I was on the same sort of inspiration point, I guess, train as a lot of people. And then I, mm. I, I to be honest, I was disabled for long before I, identified as disabled and became politically disabled as some way to say um and i think that as i recently described to a few people the issue is not that my body mind needs to change but that my particular kind of body mind has not gotten adequate health care or you know other things because of various social historical political factors, you know, I'm a disabled migrant who does not get access to public funds here in the UK. That is a huge issue. There are a lot of people who have died because of that, you know, in the austerity government. It's a human rights, um, the UN called it a human rights disaster here in the UK um, with what's happened with austerity. Um, and I think, you know, I write in my poetry, so you know, Barbara, about, you know, like what, let a, <laughs> because, you know, when your body changes so much, and again, I, I, I want to invoke, um, disability justice activist uh, from the States, Mia Mingus, her, mm, her concept yeah. of access intimacy. Mm, um, mm. 
I find that there's so much pressure to describe yourself. It's like, what's wrong with you? What's your disability? Like, how are you disabled? Describe it to me, Descri tell me. And it's like, this is very private information. And I also kind of love using that term because it's like, I don't actually need to tell you anything, right? All I do need to tell you is that um, there's often an invasion of privacy. There's often a flouting of human rights. I've experienced um, extremely traumatic things that I should not have experienced because of factors like race and gender and nationality and Indonesian and ethnicity and historical factors that are continuing. You know, there, my mother was just telling me, you know, when she was little in our home village of uh, in Wasumatra, people, if people had, um, you know, felt distress or discomfort, they would pick plants from their yard, you know, mm -hmm. and they were herbalists, right? They knew, okay, this concoction will make you feel better, or this, you know, will, um, will assist with this particular kind of body mind to thrive, right? And um, I also have Javanese as well as being Minang. And in Javanese culture, um, you know, my colleague Slamet Amek Stohari wrote a book, Disability in Java, which says that, you know, before the advent of Western colonialist Dutch medicine and hospitals, disabled people were regarded as closer to God, mm -hmm. as very holy and very um, closer to the mystic. And we're really deified. And we have disabled gods, um, actually, which is something that I, I knew my whole life. I didn't even, mm -hmm. you know, realize it. So, um, Reclaiming that and understanding that, you know, ancestrally, we have so many different kinds of exaltations for different kinds of body minds and this cruel, violent system, these mm. cruel, violent systems of colonialisms, which are not just European colonialisms, Javanese are the colonizers of Indonesia, and we do the same to other cultures, you know, to are really um, are at the root of so much so a needless suffering today and these have historical antecedents and and i'm glad that i'm working with you on on, on a project that that sort of elaborates on that a little bit and it kind of like uh, it really kind of brutally manifested in the covid 19 pandemic and um uh, jenny's just telling us that we have five minutes but i, I really wanted to ask you about um about about the article that you wrote in earth monthly uh, this mm. summer and then also the conversation that we share in the um, Paul Mellon Center, where you poignantly highlighted how the pandemic has dramatically exposed ableism in the art world. Um, and um, yeah, it would be great if you could talk and share some reflections on, on this with us today. And I'm thinking also about the commission that we're working together, which for you revolves around the idea of the word, uh, the term hidden. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly <laughs> kind yeah, of sorry. Try, and, try and blast through. No, no, no. I love, I love talking to you about, the, obviously talking about this stuff and just mindful of, of the time. Yeah. Um, um, so, okay. The first one was, remind me again, um, about, oh, oh yeah. Ableism in the art world yes. when the pandemic the started art art and yes, how that you. links to the commission on hidden in a way exactly. it's connected, right? Yes. So, um, it's online. It's available. I wrote an article this summer for it monthly entitled how to make art in a pandemic question <laughs> mark. Um, yeah. and I'm talking about, you know, I think often there, a lot of people, including myself have written, especially disabled artists have written about, you know, access needs within arts institutions. And as you say, uh, you know, thankfully that's, that's, it, it's, it's, it's improving. And it's, it's an interestingly good thing. It's improving, it's, um, it's improving thanks to you, an artist like you, like you're doing the hard oh, work. Uh, I hope, I hope, thanks. Um, and, uh, you know, we also need to, you know, zoom out and look at a different view of ableism in terms of global capital flows. So in the article, I invoke Jasper Kapoor as the right to maim this book which talks about how, you know, this concept of disability and maiming, there may be accessibility measures um, that improve, let's say, in the United States, but it's funded by, you know, selling weapons to maim people in mm -hmm. Palestine or in, you know, in Yemen, taking, you know, an example of like the UK's involvement, et cetera. So you're, you're creating disabled bodies and you're worsening disabled lives at the expense of creating accessibility measures, including in the art world. Um, so to really think about those global capital flows, which is what I discussed at our, at our joint um, event at Paul Mellon Center as well. And at, at that event, I also said that, 
you know, to say like, oh, how can we get back to a quote unquote normal? Well, that very quote unquote normal of capitalism Wasn't is working. what, yeah. And, and it actually is the cause of all of these deaths. You know, so many of these lack of healthcare in Indonesia, where I'm from, is was caused by these global capital flows. So um, it's kind of a false idea to like, let's restart the art world. It's to, you know, <laughs> in the face of this pandemic. And it's like, what is the art world's complicity in the pandemic? Um, and then the final thing very quickly is our commission. I'm very excited about working with you um, over at Welcome Collection, in which I'm exploring how the word hidden has been used, um, can be applied to different biomes and it's called molecular. And um, we shall see it's an art and, and writing form and it will be launched next spring. I'm very excited about that. Me too. Thanks, Saka, and thank you very much. And, and Jane, you. have we got any questions from our audiences? Okay, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. If somebody has any questions, I think there is an email address that Jane um, included in the guide. So you could always email that email address and maybe they can redirect them to me or I can redirect them to Oka if, you, if there is anything you want to ask. Uh, thanks so much, Oka. Thank you. And I'll see you on the screen soon, hopefully. Thank you. See you see soon. You. Bye. And now I'm going to introduce our final contributor, Patricia Dominguez, and she's also sent a pre-recorded video. Patricia is a Chilean artist bringing together an experimental research on ethnobot ethnobotany, healing practices, and the corporatization of well-being. She contributed to the book with the text Technologies of Enchantment, commissioned by Gasworks for her 2019 solo show. Patricia is preparing a new commission for Welcome Collection uh, for our forthcoming exhibition at Welcome and La Casa Encendida in Madrid, reimagining our relationship with the vegetal world. Um, and this is in partnership with Delfina Foundation. She currently has an installation at TV21 in Madrid. And next year, Patricia will be participating in the Guangzhou Biennale. So for this session, she has created a pre-recorded uh, healing session to transition, transition us back um, into our lives after the event. The video uh, is a meditation and takes as a starting point an image from the French illustrator Moibus depicting a human figure meditating with a cactus. Drawing from South American syncretic spiritual practices and Tibetan singing bowl therapies, Patricia will ask us to focus on the behavior of coarse crystals, their process of extraction, and the healing properties of the sound this mineral creates. We will be guided to synchronize with each other, with our bodies, our technologies, and the earth and our feet. Uh, the event will finish after this practice, which will last around 12 minutes. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for being here this evening to Pedro, to Patricia, to Oka, to Jane, and to Chris for the technical setup and stay safe, everybody. Bye. You can play the film. Breathe. Breathe deep. Bring your attention to the vertical axis that connects the base of your spine to your feet and your crown. You will notice that you're inside a bubble within your field of consciousness. We perceive our energy field. activate a line born from the closest plant 
that at this moment you have in your surroundings, in your room, in your home or office, towards your mind. From there, it melts into your heart. And from there, you deliver that line to your mobile. And from your mobile, it is received once again by the plant. We circulate this energy. We rotate it. It accelerates and we unify the three elements in a single bubble. We ask that they harmonize to desaturate our information systems, make our being coherent to connect with all creatures. Breathe deep. We are going to expand that bubble a meter below your feet so that it comes into contact with Mother Earth. We also expand it above your head and around your sides. We broaden it to illuminate our ancestral lineage and all those who will come after us. We are going to clean the dense energy that accumulates outside our bubbles. We ask for a rose of golden light that comes from the center of the universe and powerfully scans and cleanses us from head to toe. It goes down, turning and purifying, removing your fatigue, all tension, piercing you with its golden light. going to remove that dense energy so that it flows into the earth. You can ask to release any tension that you feel in your body, mind or heart. We send that rose to the center of the earth to be transmuted. The earth feeds our densities on our bodies. It is the great recycler. We activate a channel of light from where you're seated to the crystalline center of the earth where the quartz crystals live. Go down, down to those quartz. Choose one. Anchor yourself to it. Connect to it. Simply connect. Those quartz are great amplifiers of energy, given their piezoelectric qualities. They are violently extracted to form part of the silicon chips for our mobiles and computers. From the bottom of the earth, they are transferred by people and machines to the center of those chips that accompany us day by day 
amplifying and retransmitting your information from your mobiles and computers. From there, they continue delivering us their crystalline frequency to protect us amidst the system of fatigue. We receive it. Raise the quartz energy to yourself. Allow its frequency to go through you. We also send the crystalline energy to the hidden people following the extraction process of this quartz that is now housed in your computer and mobile. We fill in and smooth out the holes of the mines of the exploited lands. We activate the multidirectional resonance between bows, the chips of our mobiles or computers, and the silicon of the atoms that shape us. We vibrate with the center of the earth, the center of our bodies, the center of our mobiles. We balance the three centers by the vibration of the quartz. Let the intense and harmonic vibration of the quartz pass through the dissonant parts of your being. We ask that its frequencies expel all that is in yours outside. Hand it over to the earth to be transmuted. Get out. Expel the stress that you have the tension, the recurring thoughts, the fear, expel the old memories, the fatigue, the feeling of culture, expel all the disharmony there is in your being, throw it, release, All pain has a path, follow yours, digest and discharge the psychic pain that you have accumulated, travel within yourself and modify the discordant, ask for it to be released, leave inside only the wisdom that the pain has left behind and reorganize the information. Change the path. Let the sound discharge your negative energies. When you feel lighter, we will thank Gaia for eating and digesting this dense energy. And we will ask her in exchange to give us that digested, positive, nutritious energy that she has catalyzed. We construct a ray of light from the center of the earth and raise that energy back into our bubble. We incorporate this information into your skeletal system, your muscular system, your central nervous system, asking it to stabilize any imbalance at the organic level. That energy settles you, anchors you. makes you blood, makes you part of the earth. Slowly, we return here.
Remember that we're sheltered, protected, sustained by the plants and the quartz close to us.